Hello and welcome to Linux Lads, episode 112. You're very welcome back. Um, special treat this week, all four of us are back. Say hello, lads. Hello, lads. Hello. Hi. Yeah, and you might recognize our very special guest, Connor Murphy, who is... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Been a while. Uh, we, we actually celebrated, we all opened up cans to say, yeah, we're here, finally, in a while. All four of us back. Yeah, no summer break this year, so we all just like said, whenever anyone wants to take holidays, just take holidays, and it doesn't matter, we'll just pair up, um, and we'll just keep it going throughout the summer. So, much more fun that way. Um, so, Connor, I'm going to go to you first. What have you been up to? I've been getting my head straight, and work has just been hectic, and... But... I've been spending money on useless things that I shouldn't be spending money on. Don't we all? <laughs> um, so I think in a in the last couple of episodes that I've been on, I teased that I have been I bought an ebook reader, so uh, that arrived, and I've been using that sporadically. But you know, it's uh, whenever I'm in the mood for it. And the latest thing of that I've spent money on that I probably shouldn't have spent money on is there. Um, I've really I've those portable Android game console things. So um, I've placed an order hasn't arrived yet of an Ambernic RG five o five or five zero five. It is or G like, or or G. <laughs> the letters or and G. Good, good, okay. <laughs> it has an AMOLED screen. Is running Android and can emulate. Um, they say flawlessly up to like N64 and that era of of game console but it, they say pretty much um light kind of GameCube and PS2 level games as well um and there's some videos of some very I'm presuming very light but Switch games as well they they said that it's not the case of Android doesn't support it because Android has the emulators for all of these devices. It's just the, the power of the unit itself. So I have seen some Switch emulation on it, but I imagine it would be very 2D and limited. But um, I have seen some 3D um, GameCube and PS2 uh, era uh, graphics on it. And the battery life is supposed to be very good. Like you can get like easily five or six hours if you probably are frugal you probably could get up to an eight hour uh, s- session on whatever not that you'd be playing for that long but in my mind I'm, I'm thinking it could be good for flights or long train journeys or any time that if um, I'm on a, a trip away I can bring that game console with me and for the flight and maybe some downtime when I'm over there so yeah um, and it wasn't too expensive I think it was including shipping and taxes and whatnot i think it was about 150 euro so it wasn't oh wow okay it wasn't extortionately expensive at all so that's like a more entry-level steam deck kind of experience Uh, yeah Uh, a steam deck would be far more powerful um steam deck could like obviously you can play your pc games um this because it's running android they say it can do game streaming as well so you can get uh, the Steam Play app installed and there's various other ways of streaming from your host PC. They said the uh, only downside of that is some of the game streaming. Uh, I don't know if it's the Xbox One or... or the, by the Xbox One, I mean the Xbox version of game streaming. Maybe not recognise the R- R1 and R2 and L- or the, the shoulder buttons. So mm. that that... Which I imagine would be very useful for if you're trying to play a racing game remotely. Those kind of trigger buttons would be very useful. So I don't think the streaming supports that uh, caveat there. Not sure. But it's mainly a emulation device. Um, and in my research of this, so this is running Android, but there are some that both in x86 and ARM um, of these portable devices that come preloaded with a version of Linux out of the box. But because of that, there has been a third party project called Jellos, J E L O S, uh, that is just enough Linux, uh, Linux OS. And um, if you go do a web search for it and you get the GitHub and you'll get the list of supported devices, it also supports generic uh, or uh, x86 
rather than specific devices, but they say your mileage may vary. But here are the list of known supported devices. And it essentially, if you want to turn any uh, portable x86 device into a bare bones emulation device, um, apparently the the f- you get much better frames per second and game support and um, less choppiness and whatnot, uh, better performance essentially um, using Jealous than versus other ones. But the one I've ordered runs Android, so it actually doesn't support this. But in my research, I, I came across mm. Jealous, so it, it maybe we could give it a link in the sh- in the show notes just to give it a shout out. So speaking of devices, um. Amalith, you got a Librem five, and we gave you a royal a royal piss taking about that. Um, so, <laughs> go, t- tell us your experiences with the Librem five. I'm guessing you didn't spend over a grand and buy the USA made edition, did you? Absolutely correct. I spent about <laughs> like a, a four or five hour detour on my way back from visiting a client in Alabama, and that's all. I went down to visit a client in Alabama, and on the way back, Jim Salter and I had lunch. And he handed me a Librem 5 while we were together. I would not have spent even $600 on one of these. And I'm very glad I didn't because it's crap. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, we have to backpedal, but not backpedal. We have to go back a little uh, for people who don't understand, who don't know, who haven't been uh, listening for us for five years and didn't hear all our, our, especially my my rants on the topic. uh, Librem. Five is a Linux phone made by Purism, who are a company who make Linux hardware. We take a little bit of a dim view of uh, of Purism, or at least I have it. Uh, there are some questions about their customer practices. There are some questions about the hardware they produce and uh, about their shipping and so on. But uh, yeah, so that's that's background. So I'm if did you do like unboxing or did you? But what were your first feelings when you got it in your hand? What did you feel like? My my first impression, I don't, I don't want to go over the hardware too much. I'm sure it's been beaten to the ground before. But my very first impression was, this is a thick phone. <laughs> <laughs> it is thicker than my Pixel 6 with a case. And the Librem 5 does not have a case. It It feels like a brick of a phone. Thick with four Cs. Yeah, yes. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was just going to make it that joke. I was going to say, on the scale of zero to four Cs, how it thick <laughs> is. It, the thickness wouldn't bother me if the hardware was actually, you know, capable, but it's not. It's just a bad experience. So first impression of the software was that it's like really laggy and, and jittery, I guess. There. Nothing on it is smooth at all. So then I thought, It is an Android handset, is it? No, no, it's running uh, proper Linux. Oh, okay. Uh, It comes with Fosh out of the box, doesn't it? Because didn't didn't they they have a hand of developing that? Yes. It's PureOS with Fosh, and PureOS is a either Debian or Ubuntu derivative. I think it's more of a Debian derivative. But I thought, okay, this is bad, but... It was made two years ago. Maybe updating will solve some of those issues. It'll be, it'll have hardware acceleration, that kind of stuff. Maybe it'll be smoother. So I open the software center and try to update, and I can't because there are unmet dependencies of something somewhere. So I open a terminal, run apt upgrade, all the good, all that good stuff, and it still can't upgrade. And I don't know how to sort out those uh, peculiarities. Was that um, so? Do you know the history of the phone? Was it maybe that it was uh, shipped years ago and never been updated, and now when you have finally tried to update it, it doesn't work? Or did it? Is it a recent device that just came in that was just delivered from the Purism company, and updating it uh, immediately just doesn't work? I don't know all the particulars, but I am ninety percent certain that Jim didn't even really open this one and interact with it. I think the state I received it in is the state it shipped to him from Purism. And do you know how long ago was that? That was The software said it hadn't been updated in two years. Yeah, so that that's kind of, you know, uh, that's possibly... Um, so imagine that you, that you load Debian on a PC and then you leave mm. it, uh, then you leave it two years, don't touch it, and you open it. Uh, maybe that's not their fault. Like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I would expect Debian maybe to be able to do it, but 
Yeah, I wouldn't sure. risk it if it was my 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 hardware. Mm -hmm. So that's I had the same thought process, and I th I said, okay, this is a bad experience. This can't actually update to the latest release, so I'll just skip all the intermediary stuff and flash the latest stable version of PureOS. So I grab it from their website, or I download the flashing scripts from their docs and Git repositories and, and whatnot. That was a bad experience trying to flash the, the newest version of PureOS, but I, I manage it. I get it figured out after about an hour or so. It still can't update. Even though it's running the latest stable version, it still has those errors with un unmet peer dependencies or, or something. So I said, okay, fuck this. I'm not going to bother with pure <laughs> OS because I found out that post-market OS has support for the Librem 5. So I try that. Literally my next question. <laughs> it, yep, yeah. yep. So I download the uh, PM Bootstrap tool and everything just works. That was a wonderful experience flashing post-market OS on the Librem 5. I could even select which mobile front-end post-market OS used, whether that was Fosh, Gnome Mobile, Plasma Mobile, SXMO, SXMO with i3 or DWM, or no, Sway or DWM. I, I don't remember for sure. Brief point of clarification, you mentioned both Fosh and Gnome Mobile. Mm -hmm. I Impression was that they were related, or that Fosh was no mobile, or so. Would you do you know the distinction between the two? So PM Bootstrap gives you a ton of options. There's none bare minimum OS for testing manual customization, console with no graphical touch UI, literally just a console. FB keyboard is the frame buffer console with touchscreen keyboard. GNOME with Wayland. GNOME Mobile with Wayland, which is GNOME Shell patched to adapt better to phones. i3, Kodi, LXQt, Mate, and it says a stylus is recommended for both Mate and LXQt. Fosh is the mobile UI developed specifically for the Librem 5. Plasma Big Screen, Plasma Desktop, Plasma Mobile. Shell i, which is plain console with touchscreen gesture support. Sway. SXMO with DWM, SXMO with Sway, Weston, and XFCE4. So there are a ton of options. You can just pick which one, and the PM Bootstrap tool will set up PostMarket OS in a CRUT and install all the packages necessary for those particular environments. And then you, wow. the initialization command sets up like a config file, I guess, for what packages you want to install in that PostMarket OS image. And then when you run the install command, it installs all those packages into that crew, and then you flash that image to your phone. So it's it literally builds your mobile operating system just in time, like at on command. So it's it has the latest versions of everything. Wow, interesting. Um, from what what you've described to me, my interpretation of that is that Fosh uh, is developed for the phone and potentially. The development might have stalled or might be slightly slower or whatever. Um, so the community is rallied around GNOME Mobile as the kind of the successor or whatever. Um, so probably they, they coexist for that reason. I will put a video that compares Fosh and GNOME Mobile from on YouTube. I will put it in the show notes. Cool. Oh, okay, cool. So my experience, I think Fosh, GNOME Mobile and Plasma Mobile are the most user-friendly and mature. Plasma Mobile was, like, amazing. I could see, like, a, a dedicated person actually using Plasma Mobile on the Librem 5 as a daily driver, potentially. I haven't tried it with phone calls or texts or mobile data, just based on, like, Wi-Fi and application availability and how the experience was interacting with those. Plasma Mobile was amazing, but I personally prefer the aesthetics of GNOME, so GNOME Mobile is what I'm running right now. And it's still a good experience, taking into account that the hardware is terribly underpowered. Everything is still a little bit jittery. It's smoother than before, but it's still definitely not a pleasant experience, which makes me really interested to get a PinePhone Pro and see what these are like on that, because the PinePhone has much better hardware than the Librem 5. 
Um, I don't want to assume, but it would make sense. But I just want to clarify: uh, is our flat fax supported on it uh, with either a no mobile or plasma mobile? Yeah, it's proper post market OS just on a phone. So anything okay, you can do yeah. on desktop Linux, you can do on the Librem Five with PMOS or with Pure OS. Oh, and I did try plugging it into a screen and messing around with convergence a little bit. That was cool, but you run into the Librem 5 having shitty hardware, and it's <laughs> it's cool that you can. It's a neat party trick, but I wouldn't use it as like a laptop replacement in the slightest. So YouTube was a slideshow, baby. <laughs> uh, yeah, I did try YouTube, even without convergence, just like on the phone itself. It was a slideshow. It was it was bad. Oh, wow. Okay, so not a ringing endorsement then. No, not at all. <laughs> Don't buy the Librem 5. <laughs> Maybe wow. the PinePhone okay. Pro if you're interested in tinkering a little bit, but not the Librem 5. I wouldn't pay $20 for it. Mm. Okay. I'm probably going to give this Librem 5 to a friend of mine. She said she was interested in trying it as well, so I'll ship it to her later on. I'd imagine its, it's use would be just a dev test device, possibly. I mean, Or a doorstop. <laughs> or that in your own um handling of it do you have a theory as to why it's so thick is it that there's a chunking battery in it or is it build quality or um all of the above so i'll take it apart here hold on so this is the phone i don't have any way to measure it but it's like an inch thick, maybe, maybe just under. And then I take the battery oh. out. The battery is over half the width of the phone. It's <laughs> massive. Um, it, uh, d- the battery does appear to be quite thick, but doesn't seem to be that tall. So possibly no. they just picked a generic uh, mail order battery rod. I mean, you can imagine they could make the same capacity battery be twice as tall, but uh, narrower mm-hmm. potentially they didn't have to make anything these kind of batteries are you know the battery that you talk about like uh, if you think about the last Samsung Galaxy that had a re- user replaceable battery you can still get those or at least you could a few years back definitely since the Librem started being manufactured you could always get these uh, uh, kind of thin and taller batteries for the 2016-17 mm-hmm. generation of flagships and it's not it's i i don't know why they do it this way so if you compare it for example with uh with the fairphone which is an android device true so there is not as much hardware enablement issues as there would have been with a pure linux device but those people have been manufacturing and you know shipping actually um devices for uh for a very long time and they uh they might be a slightly bigger and but that's not just because, but that's probably not because they are not capable to manufacture it in the form they want. Uh, they want it to, but basically that's because it enables the repairability of the device. I don't, basically, whenever I look at this specific Librem 5 phone that the Purism uh, company does, I am always baffled why, why they choose to do this, this way. And uh, yeah, it's just, I don't know, confusing. I mean, the, 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 the Pine phone has a user re- replaceable battery as well, doesn't it? I think so. Yeah, yeah I'm I pretty so. sure. I, I don't know off the top of my head, but it does seem like something. And uh, Mike, you've already mentioned the um, the fair phone that does. Um, and did I hear that there is some kind of um, EU legislation that's coming down? Yeah. So in the European Union... Oh, yeah. I'm not sure when it starts, if it's next year or maybe the year after, but everybody, will, every phone manufacturer will have to enable a replaceable battery. It's, it's good. I wonder, uh, you know, it makes, uh, this, is the, this is also what's called the Brussels effect. Uh, so some European Union is big enough, to, has enough regulatory power that if they decide something like this, it's usually cheaper for manufacturers to implement it around the world. So you know, it might be that Europe came up with it, but you probably will be buying uh, anything, pixels, iPhones, with reviews replaceable batteries all around the world, unless something bad happens, you know. this And this is definitely a good thing. And I'm pretty sure that if pressed hard enough, Apple will be able to deliver 
just as thin an iPhone with user replaceable battery as they do now. My only issue with that is that it could create uh, more waste indirectly um, because you have to create more more stuff you know have to you have to design the product in such a way that the case can be removed and it's actually a lot more efficient in terms of materials to just make it a closed case then you don't have to worry about unlocking mechanisms and latches and stuff like that so it's actually using less material to have a have an enclosed battery that you can't remove i think anyway I think the idea is that mobile phones have peaked. Like, if you look at any Marquez Brownlee video over the last year or two, he's saying basically the gist of it. Or any, if you if you look at the phones, if you listen to press releases, even if you look at the keynotes from any big manufacturer, is yeah, we are kind of doing more more of the same. So that means that people buy mobile phones and keep them for longer. So making mm. them, and I think that making them last longer, because the buff battery is usually the things, one of the first things to go, right? And once that go, if you can't replace it, then you might as well decide to buy a cheaper, de- buy a newer device, right? Mm. But if you can replace the battery yourself, then you might keep a phone for five years. That will probably make up, as long as that happens, that will make up for any extra bits of plastic that manufacturers have to put into it in order to make the battery user replaceable, I think. So there, we, we've talked about pixels. We've talked about device longevity. So when Google announced the Pixel 8, they officially committed to seven years of software updates, not just security patches, but like feature updates for the Pixel 8. So if phones are required to have user replaceable batteries, that's the component that fails most often and earliest and it has seven years of software updates, that means that phone could conceivably last for a full seven years. Even if there's a little bit more material that that goes into that phone for making the battery user replaceable, it's going to last over more than twice as long as phones that have three years of software updates, for example. It, it's going to last a long time, and that's a, that's a lot less material in aggregate than would be required to make the battery user replaceable. We've we've mentioned Fairphone um, on on this podcast before, and we've mentioned it uh, earlier um, in this episode several times. I've find what they're doing incredibly compelling. What has held me in uh, from ordering in the past when I've considered uh, replacing my phone or refreshing my phone or whatever, which I do um, way too often. Uh, <laughs> I I know it's wasteful, but you know, you know uh, I. It's something I'm working on, but it's like, ooh, the new shiny. I must spend money on it. Uh, this <laughs> this whole consumerism, which I'm trying to cut back on. But so the latest phone that I uh, ordered and it's um, on my desk beside me at the moment. And literally when it arrived, uh, I was humming and hawing over ordering a fair, fair phone. And I went, oh, but once you go AMOLED, you kind of don't go back. And the Fairphone 4, which was the latest at the time, didn't have an AMOLED screen. I was like, oh, and the, and this one that I kind of want is 800, which is a, a very expensive, but I, I got it. So I, I, it's the um, Asus Zenfone 10, which is very compact. And it's, I, I, nothing wrong with it, so I, I quite like it. And literally within weeks of it arriving, Fairphone 5 came out with an AMOLED screen. I was like, damn it! <laughs> Yeah, Eliza. Eliza has ordered one, and uh, it's gonna be coming soon. So, uh, I'll, I'll, she will let you know how it, how it is. Uh, I, I look forward to to feed feedback in relation to that. But yeah, so in the interest of this whole talk about keeping phones for a very long time, this phone that I've literally just ordered within a month ago probably should last me a very long time. But. Um, for anyone listening to this episode, if you're ever um, kind of tempted by being less wasteful and using a device for longer, strongly consider the Fairphone 5 because it seems to be uh, it seems to have a lot of features that you'd be looking for, including the, re- the user replaceable parts. And now with an AMOLED screen. Every time you say AMOLED, I think you're saying AMOLED. So, yeah, I, I was, uh, I was, I was actually, you know, when you when you were talking about the per- first thing there, Connor, I was thinking, is he talking about an orgy with an Amolif screen? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess summary for the Librem Five: the hardware is crap. Don't buy this phone. But if you're interested in Linux on mobile, 
the software seems to have come a long way, and it is promising. And I do absolutely intend to get a PinePhone Pro at some point to try the software on better hardware. So if you're looking for a phone that is, is positive in the freedom dimension, get a PinePhone Pro. It's been a while since we've heard that. <laughs> well, hold on. So, uh, you know, if depends for what. I think, I think the PinePhone is still, and I don't think nobody's hiding that, but I think the PinePhone Pro or otherwise is still... That's like saying you can use Raspberry Pi for your uh, day-to-day computing. Yes. I guess some people could, but with many caveats, like, and that's before you talk about the software, but just the hardware is not designed for uh, what most people use uh, mobile phones these days. But what I'm trying to find out, you know, research in motion, ha ha ha, uh, <laughs> is... Uh, what, uh, you know, on post-market OS, uh, since it got such a good reviews here, uh, what devices are available? I'll put the post-market OS wiki uh, that has got the devices into the show notes so that you, if you if you have maybe a, a, an old Samsung Galaxy lying in your, uh, you know, there's basically there's quite a few phones that they support. I think the OnePlus 60, that's a 2018 phone, I think. Um, Samsung Galaxy A5. Yeah, the phones that they say that they support are a bit older, but that just means that maybe people have them in their drawers and they can try them. They can try post market on OS on them. And they're all going to have varying levels of hardware support. For, for example, yeah. um, Something on a, a Galaxy A5 might not have mobile data working. Yeah, they have compatibility metrics uh, mm-hmm. uh, on the on the on the wiki. Yeah, it's as you say, it's not all supported everywhere. But um, if people wanted to just for, you know just for, just to try out how good uh, mobile Linux is these days, then it could be good choice. Or, but you know, on the other hand, the Pine Phone Pro and uh, Purism Libre Five seem to have like full support except for nfc that that probably just means that the phones don't actually have nfc i'm not sure i know the librem 5 does not have nfc how do you do apple pay then oh hold on (laughs) (laughs) and to to reiterate i would not recommend relying on any of this as a daily driver it would be for people who want to tinker with linux on mobile Mm. Yeah, it wouldn't. It, this shouldn't be your primary device, most mm-hmm. most likely. Right. Uh, and the potential alternative, um, which is also something that uh, gets a lot of love from the uh, open source and hacker community, is if you have a device that you've tried running post market OS on and didn't quite have the hardware support or whatnot. There's always Lineage OS, and Lineage Lineage OS does have a, a wide range of. Um, uh, device support not everything but it has a very wide range of device support and i say to that noob and uh, maybe it's just <laughs> because i'm old right so i i've i've i've, I've had a lot over uh, about lineage os and i've tested it and last time so what happened elisa's phone uh broke and i uh until her new phone is arrived she's using my old one plus seven t now, I uh, previously put some custom ROM to, on the OnePlus 7T because I wanted to try it. And then I uh, looked again at this opportunity and got uh, there's a specific ROM for the OnePlus 7T on for Lineage OS. I can't recommend it. Like, it's to get it on the phone, it's a pain in the arse. Unless you are uh, like really comfortable with, uh, with Linux command line. And if you are, then fine. But, you know, for, uh, I don't know, it's just, uh, it's just annoying. The the possibility that you break the damn thing, uh, yeah, that's always there. Second, you you know you have to unlock the bootloader. The phone doesn't drag there, so there's a big old warning when you restart it. If you lock it back, I've tried before, it didn't work. It just wouldn't boot, so you have to keep it unlocked. I'm not even sure about the security implications of that. I'm I don't know. Uh, it's meant to be getting updates because it's the nightly, but it's not. So it feels like, and I compare that to I think what you have. Um, Amoleth, you have the Pixel 6 with, uh, what's the Graphene super OS. safe OS called? Graphene OS, right? Mm-hmm. That's a different story. So with Graphene OS, as a dedicated team of people who took, it takes a couple of devices, if I understand it, and they make the software for those devices. And that's a crucial 
crucial difference. You know, we are all used from the x86 world that you can take an operating system and a piece of hardware and most things will work out of the box. I don't think that's ever to be expected on the phone or on anything that runs on an ARM SOC. Mm. Exactly. Yeah, and that's basically that's basically it. That's why I don't like uh, I wouldn't recommend Lineage OS for just anybody. Yeah, you need to you need to because it gives you a working operating system and I'm not myself quite sure how safe, secure and even functional it actually is and maybe next it won't survive the next restart. You know, that's that's why I don't like it. I like it better if people really have only a few devices that they support. They uh, maybe as time proceeds, they upgrade up, upgrade the devices, get new ones, but you know, give them their full attention. Mm. Uh, yeah, Mike. Mike raised a good point there. Another viable alternative is if you just want the simple order a device and you can put an alternative um, operating system on it that is more secure. Is get a Pixel device and put Graphene OS on it. Mm. And. Graphene OS commits to software updates for as long as Google does. So if you were to get like the Pixel 8, then you'd have seven years of Graphene OS updates. And I I fully intend to keep my Pixel 6 for the full five years until Graphene OS no longer officially supports it. After that, maybe I'll get the newer Pixel, which has even longer software support. (laughs) Ah, Just say no and use an iPhone. (laughs) (laughs) God. But I don't like iOS. Oh, me neither. Yeah, I hate it. Yeah. I hate no, it. no, I hate it. Yeah, I, I had to use an iPhone it. for a month, and I just couldn't deal with it. I absolutely love it. It's just <laughs> fine for me, I guess. That's a good place to uh, leave it, I think. So, uh, just a quick announcement before we wrap up: uh, we will all, all four of us, I believe, will be at the Ubuntu Summit, November third to November fifth, in Riga, Latvia. So. Come find us there. We'll try to wear our Linux Lads shirts uh, and announce ourselves a little bit. And we went last year. It was absolute utter blast. Just probably one of the most fun things I've ever done in in this whole Linux C world. And yeah, just an absolute blast of a, of of a, of a conference. Um, met so many people, had so many interesting conversations. So please come up to us and say hi. Uh, if you do spot us at the festival or hear our voices, because you won't see us. <laughs> I'll be giving a lightning talk on my software Willow that I've been working on for a little bit. I believe Mike will also be giving a lightning talk. Yeah, I'll be talking about how I use my spreadsheets in the command line about Visidata. So watch out for Amalith and Mike's talks. Uh, I won't be doing a talk because I don't know anything. And <laughs> no, Nor will I. I also don't know anything. Um, I, I will say this. Um, do not be afraid to reach out to us on any of the socials um, as individuals or as the podcast in general. We will be there and we'll be provided the schedule of uh, talks and whatnot permits. We'll be up for meeting up with um, the community people there. Do not feel feel uh, afraid to come up to us and say hi. Uh, we might meet up for a lunch, or uh, we inv- inevitably will probably end up back in the pub. So you might find <laughs> us in which whichever pub that everyone is going to in the evening. So if you find us there, uh, do not be afraid to come up to, and to us and say hi. Yeah, and uh, yeah, obviously Connor is fishing for free drinks. So um. <laughs> <laughs> I w- uh, that is not what I was going with. <laughs> yeah come up just just buy me a drink it's okay um <laughs> Gen- genuinely that is not what i was doing i'm going i'm perfectly willing to pay my own way okay so i think we'll uh wrap it up there so you can get us on you can get all our socials on linuxlads.com forward slash contact um and then yeah all the rest will be on the contact page so i won't go into it um thanks for tuning in it's good to have all four of us back and we will see you again in two weeks adios Bye. Bye. Um, okay, so let me burp first of all. Excuse me. <laughs> That's definitely going in at the end. <laughs> <laughs>